On islands scattered across the Pacific, men of two nations fight for their lives. At stake, Axis world domination and America under the threat of invasion. Here, the war comes down to this, soldier against soldier, guns in their hands. Now, the anatomy of a gunfight. We're boots on the ground in World War II, and this is Shootout, the Pacific. Macon Atoll, 1942. It's one of the first face-to-face -face meetings on the ground between the US and Japan, Marine raiders blasting away against Japanese killers. The firefight against the enemy is part of the first American campaign against Japan on the ground. Well-armed Marine raiders are eager for battle. The Marine Raiders had such superior firepower that they had confidence that they could overwhelm any Japanese force they encountered. For six months after Pearl Harbor, the news had been nothing but bad. America and its allies pushed back as Japan launched a killing spree that engulfed millions. That was then. Now, in August 1942, American Marines suddenly challenged the enemy on land. Here's the background. The raid on Macon is unprecedented. Shrouded in secrecy, the Marines have been delivered by the Argonaut and Nautilus, two of the Navy's largest submarines. But with 222 raiders on board, the subs are packed solid. A thousand miles away, Americans are storming the beaches of Guadalcanal. The strike on Macon is designed to distract the enemy and keep him guessing. The Macon raid was conducted to basically deceive the Japanese into believing that there were additional landings other than the Guadalcanal landings that were taking place. The Macon raid uh, took place 10 days after the initial landings at Guadalcanal. Leading the 2nd Marine Raider Battalion is 46-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Evans Carlson, son of a Congregationalist minister. Carlson believes teamwork is the key to making it through the war alive. Evans Carlson had spent some time with the Chinese Communist forces in 1937, and he coined a phrase um, called gung ho. He actually introduced that word into English, and it means work in harmony. Gung ho becomes the battalion's creed. Carlson's executive officer is Major James Roosevelt, son of the president. They lead the raiders toward the raid on Macon. Here's the matchup, the American Marine. He's about 19 years old. He's highly trained and well-led, but has never been in battle. On the other side, the Japanese soldier, in his 20s. Chances are he's already seen lots of action. He's lightly armed, but believes he's invincible. The Japanese are armed with a few machine guns and 6.5 millimeter bolt action rifles. Their weapons are no match for the Americans with their M1 Garand semi-automatic rifles and quick-to-fire portable machine guns like the Browning automatic rifle. August 17, 1942, 5.30 a.m., Butari Tari Island in the Macon Atoll. 222 Marines hit the beaches in rubber boats and hustle to unload and move inland. Butari Tari Island is barely half a mile wide, and the Marines move quickly across the distance. It's 222 Marines against 45 Japanese, but intelligence is sketchy. Estimates could be wrong. As many as 160 of the enemy may be here. They assumed that we would have about a two to one ratio of attackers versus defenders. So that would have meant that there was about 100 Japanese on the island. 
But the Japanese have no plans to run when the Marines come knocking. Local Commander Sergeant Major Kanemitsu Hisamitsu responds to a general alert issued by Tokyo after the invasion of Guadalcanal and prepares his men for any American attack. First platoon of Marine Company A, about 30 men, splits off and crosses the island from south to north. Here, natives tell them the Japanese are assembling about a mile down the island to the west. The platoon is led by 2nd Lieutenant Wilfred Le Francois, a man they call Frenchy. Le Francois was a, a maverick. He came up through the ranks, an old China Marine. He was well liked by the people because he, he'd been through everything you could go through as a, as a Marine. The confrontation will put 60 Marines up against 50 Japanese. Here's the setup. Le Francois has one platoon of 30 men on direct advance. There's another platoon nearby, giving the Marines 60 for the shootout. About 75 yards in front of them, the Japanese have four machine gun nests. A dozen enemy snipers are set up in the trees. And about 25 infantrymen are boarding a truck that will rush them to the fight. Lieutenant Le Francois advances, deploying his men in a wedge formation, as effective against an opposing line on the battlefield as it is in football. The wedge is an effective formation that's been used for centuries. It provides effective firepower on all sides, in the front, the left, and right flank. And it's used uh, by the Marines even today to attack enemy forces. In an engagement like this, the commander who lets loose with the most fire first usually wins and Le Francois knows it. His scouting party suddenly saw a Japanese truck pull up about 300 yards down the road and 10 to 25 Japanese piled out of this truck. Here's how the battlefield shapes up. Le Francois organizes a firing line to ambush the Japanese. He orders men from the flanks to move forward, creating a cul-de-sac facing the approaching enemy. When the Japanese walk into it, they'll be torn apart by fire coming from multiple directions. Sergeant Clyde Thomason is a key player, taking over once the lieutenant issues his orders. Sergeant Clyde Thomason was a, what we would call a good old boy from Atlanta, Georgia. He was a career Marine. He had served in China. He knew how to operate men. He could get people where they needed to be when they needed to be there. Thomason keeps his men down and quiet. The Japanese approach. They do not see the Americans, but the Americans can see them. The trap is waiting to be sprung. Sergeant Thomason waited until the approaching Japanese were about 30 yards away. The tension among the Marines on the line must have been unbearable as they waited for the enemy to come closer and closer and closer before the first trigger was pulled. Thomason cradles his 12-gauge shotgun, the personal defense weapon he was allowed to choose as a non-commissioned officer. At just the right moment, with every man in the line ready, he shouts the order, let him have it. Withering fire from the Marine line cuts down the advancing Japanese like grass in the blades of a mower. But the shootout is far from over. There's a problem. There are a dozen enemy snipers and four machine guns hidden in the vegetation. On cue, the Japanese open up on the Marines. Instead of taking cover, Sergeant Thomason works his way up and down the firing line, fine-tuning it to meet the threat. He courageously exposes himself to fire, staying focused on the battle. The one thing that he did was get moving people up closer to where they could get a better sight of what's going on. And he was up there, hey, move up, get over here, uh, get a better shot.
from where I was laying. I saw him a couple times moving, and then he was down, and that was the end of that. A sniper nailed him. Sergeant Clyde Thomason is the first to fall, but he is by no means the last. August 17, 1942, 7 a.m. Make an atoll in the mid-Pacific. A platoon of U.S. Marines is locked in a deadly shootout with 50 Japanese killers. The Americans have crossed the half-mile width of Butari Tari Island after landing on its southern shore. Now, the enemy is in their faces. A dozen snipers in the trees pour lead on the Marines. The Marines spot the threat, zero in, and let it fly. Four enemy machine guns are also threatening the Marines. Japanese gunners struck by American bullets are quickly replaced. And the fire continues nonstop. Marine Corporal Lewis Chapman and his crew takes on one nest in what becomes a machine gun to machine gun duel. Chappie, as they call him, aims at the enemy nest 50 yards away. His Browning light machine gun fires from a 250 round belt fed from the side. Japanese machine guns are fed from 30 round strips and are more difficult to reload. Chappie has to fire 400 rounds, but in this shootout, he's the one who comes up the winner. We had that low air-cooled machine gun. When you got it set up, it was probably about a foot, not more than a foot off the ground, the whole thing. The Japanese had machine guns that were set up above the ground, and in order for the men to fire it, they had to expose themselves. And this is why Chappie did such a good job on those people. More than a dozen Japanese bodies are found in the machine gun nest, a testament to the determination they had in keeping their gun blasting away. Then, without warning, the Japanese launch two bonsai charges as dozens of soldiers swarm the battlefield. It's a human wave, hell-bent on killing. The Japanese mindset was to attack, attack, attack at that point in the war. They were devoted to the warrior spirit, and they felt that the warrior spirit could overcome any obstacle. So they would not hesitate to launch a charge into superior firepower feeling that their warrior spirit would prevail, which, of course, it did not. The charging Japanese are annihilated, and they run out of men to reinforce their line. The guns peter out. The shootout didn't last over 20 minutes, from the first sniper shot to the final charge by the enemy and, uh, and the wipeout. 14 Americans have been killed in the firefight, but as many as 160 Japanese have been slaughtered. The Marines don't realize it, but they have virtually destroyed the entire enemy garrison on Butari Tari. But rough seas keep the Marines stranded on the beach for two days, losing most of their weapons in failed attempts to rejoin the submarines. Carlson is so despondent he contemplates surrender, not knowing there are no Japanese to surrender to. In the end, the men do make it back to the Nautilus and Argonaut. 
they took names, and the American people know it. I think that the men did their job on the raid, and they did it well. But the raid clearly didn't achieve what it was set out to do, which was to divert the Japanese attention. It gets worse. Nine Marines have been accidentally left behind. They are captured by Japanese who arrive after the raid and are beheaded under orders of an admiral later executed as a war criminal. Nearly a year after the Macon raid, Americans are 200 miles west of Guadalcanal on New Georgia in the Solomon Islands chain. It is the next step in America's march toward Japan. July 19th, 1943, 3 p.m., New Georgia in the Solomon Islands. A machine gun squad, about six men, from the 4th Marine Raider Battalion, is in reserve, waiting for orders in an assault on Bairoko, a harbor on New Georgia's coast. It's 800 Marines against 1,400 Japanese. Here's the battleground. Bairoko Harbor is located on the northwest corner of New Georgia. Directly in front of it is a band of heavy Japanese defenses. The Marines are advancing one mile from the east, and a line thick with Japanese machine gun nests is holding them up. The Marine machine gun squad that was waiting in reserve now gets the word to move out. They wanted our squad, along with a lieutenant by the name of Corbett, and his runner to take us around and hopefully behind these machine guns and dispose of them so that the rest of the battalion could go forward. Olin Gray is a 20-year-old private, an assistant gunner in the Marine squad, whose primary weapon is the Browning light machine gun. He and the others in the six-man squad hope to get in position for a flank attack on the Japanese machine guns. It is exactly what the operation needs. The flank attack is one of the most sought after attacks in infantry tactics, simply because you're firing straight into your enemy's side, and therefore, if he turns to face you, the people that he'd been firing with are then firing into his side. So he's kind of caught in a, a double 90 degree hammer, if you would. It's six Marines going after 18 Japanese. The Americans are walking into an ambush. Here's the setup. Three Japanese machine guns are hidden in the jungle around an open area, one at the 10 o'clock position, one at the 12 o'clock position, and one at the two o'clock position. 175 yards away, the Marines advance into the clearing with 200 yards of open space in front of them. They let us get halfway out, halfway across this open space before they opened up. And that's when uh, the crap hit the fan. In a matter of minutes, everyone in the squad is either killed or wounded. Private Olin Gray is the only Marine able to fight. Olin Gray is a Marine alone, outnumbered and outgunned. Japanese fire is coming straight at him. He has no idea if it's safe to retreat, so Olin Gray does the only thing he can do to survive. July 20th, 1943, 4 p.m., New Georgia, Solomon Islands. Private Olin Gray is the only Marine left standing in a six-man shootout against 18 Japanese. He's pinned down by fire from three Japanese machine guns in a clearing near Bairoko Harbor. Bairoko is on the northwest coast of the island and is protected by rings of strong defenses, including the machine gun nests now shooting right at Private Gray. Everything happened so fast. When all this started, I know it hit the ground and I got a hold of a machine gun, a couple boxes of ammunition, and uh, loaded her up, and uh, I could tell pretty well where the fire was coming from. 
Machine guns on both sides routinely fire tracer rounds every third shot. It helps the gunner to aim his fire, but it also helps the other side to locate the gun. Gray can spot two nests ahead and to the left and is sure there's a third to the right. The tripod for Gray's machine gun, normally carried by the squad leader, is missing. Incredibly, he holds the gun in his arms and fights back. Olin Gray almost becomes Rambo, essentially, picking up his 30 caliber light machine gun and directing the fire at these bunkers that are firing at him. He's standing up the whole time and firing. And that's an extremely difficult thing to do. Well, without a tripod, I had a machine gun in the crook of my arm and was firing it with my right hand. And when it ran out, I had to stop, open the breech, and to start another belt through. His Browning light machine gun weighs 31 pounds and spits out eight rounds per second. But Gray must fire in short spurts only, so the gun won't jam from overheating. For two hours, he fires burst after burst at the enemy, standing in one spot and hardly changing positions at all. The main reason I had for moving was to be able to pick up another box of ammunition and open it and started in the gun. Standing up that long in plain sight and not being killed, somebody up there was looking after me. And I do believe that sincerely. There's nothing in Marine Corps training that probably would have prepared Olin Gray to do what he did. But I think that this is um, an example of just an ordinary individual, an ordinary American doing something extraordinary. I didn't have a plan at all. My only plan was to keep alive and get it out of there some way with my skin. The only thing I was interested in was saving this old boy's hide. In Olin's shootout, the best defense is a good offense. He began the fight with 2,000 rounds of ammunition, and by dusk, he has just half a belt left, no more than 125 shots. Across the clearing, Two Japanese machine guns are silent. A few of Olin Gray's rounds, just enough, got the job done. He slips into the jungle for cover during the night and will get the order to withdraw by morning. Despite Olin Gray's personal victory, the Americans need another five weeks to finish taking New Georgia. The Japanese successfully evacuate thousands of troops before Bairoko Harbor finally falls on August 28, 1943. In the next year, the Allies remain relentless in pressing against Japan's Pacific perimeter. By 1944, they take New Guinea, and General Douglas MacArthur's drive to return to the Philippines is in full throttle. 500 miles east of the Philippines is the island of Peleliu in the Palau Archipelago. 20,000 men in the 1st Marine Division invade on September 15, 1944. Some say the Japanese there threaten MacArthur's flank. Others say the island should be bypassed. The only thing everyone agrees upon is whatever goes down here will be ugly. I've always taken the position that they weren't going to give the 1st Marine Division the weekend off, and that if we weren't going to land on Peleliu, we were going to land someplace else, who knows where. And therefore, we were given a job to do, and we did it. September 19, 1944, 2.30 p.m. Peleliu Island. Captain Everett Pope is getting ready to take a position called Hill 100. But it won't be easy. He commands a Marine company seriously depleted by battle. Captain Pope landed on Peleliu with about 240 men. In the two days before the assault on Hill 100 on September 19th, the company had been in some serious fighting, and Pope was down to 90 men by the time he received orders to seize the hill. Hill 100 is identified as a high point on a ridge in the central part of Peleliu. The high ground is always important in military campaigns, so Pope is given the assignment and follows through despite the fact that so many of his buddies have been killed. Well, in most cases, when you don't have a steady stream of replacements, 
and there are objectives that need to be taken, the, uh, the Marines push forward. Suddenly, as many as 600 Japanese in the surrounding heights pummel the hillside with shells and gunfire. Going up the slopes, Pope's men carry only light weapons. Well, we were armed as a rifle company. Many, most of the men are armed with rifles. We had some light machine guns with us, but uh, we had nothing special. They also have almost no ammunition. A rifleman normally carries about 28 round clips for his semi-automatic M1 Garand, but these men, at this moment, have close to zip. We did not have anywhere near the amount of fire that we normally would have had because we had fought all day. Heading up the steep slope, the men are hardly in a position to fight back. The only tactic they can employ is simply to spread out and hope they don't get shot. We were trained enough in combat to know that you stay as separate from each other as is possible in any combat situation. And in going up this hill, uh, we did just that. And then it just became a mad dash for the top and the devil take the hindermost. Pope and his men reach the hilltop, but at a terrible cost. 65 men are lost on the way up. At the top, it gets worse. It's 25 Marines facing 100 Japanese. Well, when we got to the top of the hill, we found a situation that we really hadn't expected to find. There was a flat area on the top of that hill, and I've described it as perhaps the size of a tennis court. And unfortunately, it was not the highest elevation. There was a higher elevation beyond us, which enabled the enemy to look down at us. Now, the maps were incorrect. We did not know that that's the way it would be. And we found ourselves in a tough position with the enemy able to look down and fire down at us as we gathered together what were left of us on this plateau. Taking cover wherever they can, the Marines prepare to hold the ground. The Japanese will wait until night to strike back. Pope and his men have only the ammo they carried with them. None of them knows how long they can hold out. September 19th, 1944, 8 p.m. Peleliu Island. Nightfall in the South Pacific. The place is a position called Hill 100, a high point on the ridge in the middle of the island. Japanese artillery hammers the two dozen Marines who have taken the hilltop during the day. In an area the size of a tennis court, they take whatever defensive positions they can find, waiting for the enemy to attack. It's four Japanese against every Marine. We just did the best we could to find places to set up the machine guns, to put the riflemen down, to stay out of trouble as best we could. We knew we were in big trouble. Here's the battlefield. Company commander Captain Everett Pope and his men cannot dig in on the hard surface. They arrange themselves to find whatever cover they can. Ahead of them is an incline leading to a higher elevation, where the Japanese are in a perfect position to attack. At least 100 enemy are thought to have direct sight of the Americans, perhaps many more. So far, the Japanese have been firing from a distance, But now, they get personal. In the course of the night, the Japanese launched several counterattacks against Pope. These were not bonsai charges. These were, were calculated, careful counterattacks by experienced soldiers. Amid the shell bursts and gunfire, the battle devolves into face-to-face -face fighting that could not have been more raw. Two Japanese come out of nowhere. 
They attack Lieutenant Francis Burke and Sergeant James McAlarns. The men on both sides have rifles in their hands, but this is too close for shooting, and bayonets take over. Burke gets a Japanese blade in the leg. Burke explodes in a rush of adrenaline, beating his assailants senseless with nothing more than bare fists. McAlarnus bludgeons the other Japanese with the butt of his rifle, in a hatred magnified by the lens of war. The Marines are taught to kill. They engage the enemy and they kill them, and that's something that the Marine Corps is known for. Against Japan, they faced a ruthless foe. There was no quarter given on either side in the Pacific War. It was either kill or be killed. McAlarnus and Burke have no time to savor victory. The two Marines heave the enemy corpses down the steep hill and return to battle. For a time, the Marines hold their own, but their supplies are critically low, especially ammunition. Infantry, whether it's a division or a squad, can fight for a day or two without food, and they can fight, depending on the climate, for maybe an hour or two without water. She can't fight for five minutes without ammunition. The Marines hang on by a thread throughout the night. Grenades are an important weapon, but they're so short in supply, the men resort to throwing rocks at the Japanese, creeping up the hill toward them. It's a clever tactic throw a rock down the hill as the enemy advances. Throw rocks down the hill three times, and each time the Japanese, thinking it's a grenade, will dive for cover. But if by chance they see the rock, they'll probably curse the Marines for the trick. Sooner or later, though, it won't be a rock. The real grenade will explode. And even if it doesn't kill or wound anyone, it keeps the enemy at bay, slows them down. The Marines hang on, but by morning, only nine of them remain alive, and almost 100 Japanese infantry are preparing a major assault. The only safe place is within American lines, down the hill to the rear. And we realized at that point we'd better get off this hill. And uh, as we were getting ready to get off, battalion ordered us to come off. And so we just beat it down to the bottom of the hill. Everybody except me was wounded. Uh, and I was immediately hit when I got down to the bottom of the hill. I was hit by artillery. And there's the slightest doubt that it was our own artillery for trying to fire over our head, but had a short round or two. And uh, that, that causes a lot of casualties. Captain Pope's stand on Hill 100 is heroism to the extreme in a losing gunfight. Another two months are needed to defeat the Japanese on Peleliu. 1,252 Americans are killed. The Japanese lose their entire garrison, nearly 11,000 dead. The lopsided numbers are typical of the Pacific War, where Japanese prefer death to surrender or capture. In the next year, the Allies tighten the noose around Japan. By 1945, MacArthur returns to the Philippines. When Manila and other principal targets are taken, Americans chase the Japanese to northern Luzon, where a six-week fight develops in the mountains on the Villa Verde Trail. March 10, 1945, 3 a.m. Villa Verde Trail in the Philippines. Private First Class Thomas Atkins of the U.S. Army's 32nd Infantry Division is with two buddies awaiting orders for the next day. They are part of a platoon in position on a slope above the trail. Their only shelter is the hole they've dug with their entrenchment tools. The expression is foxholes, but that connotates a round circle and deep. And we didn't do that. We made slit trenches, which is uh, the length of a soldier and the width of two or three soldiers. It's 30 Americans against 175 Japanese. 
Here's the setup. The Japanese are getting ready to attack, two companies strong. Their plan is to sneak forward and find a place to break through the Army platoon's perimeter. And right now, they have their sights set on the foxhole where Atkins and his two pals are on guard. It was nighttime when this action took place, and it would have commenced by three or four Japanese crawling up, not standing, but trying to crawl up to uh, approach the position. The shootout begins. The three GIs in the foxhole pour out as much lead as their M1 Garands will shoot. But more Japanese join in, and the Americans are nearly overwhelmed. It's the worst case scenario. Both of his companions are shot dead, and Atkins is suddenly alone. He himself has taken three enemy bullets. No one would blame him for falling back, but he ignores the pain, keeps his eye on the ball, and doesn't even think of retreat. The Japanese will keep coming, and Atkins will point his M1 and fire to hold them off. He's fighting solo, but he'll keep it up all night long. March 10th, 1945, 4 a.m. Villa Verde Trail, the Philippines. Private First Class Joseph Atkins has been shot three times. His two buddies are dead. He has been fighting alone for over an hour. Atkins is on Luzon, the northernmost of the Philippines' major islands, where the Japanese are trying to stop the U.S. Army. His foxhole in the Philippine mountains bears the brunt of a Japanese attack by 175 men, trying to pulverize a single American platoon. The only thing Atkins has to keep the enemy at bay is his rifle, an M1 Garand. I think the M1 Garand was one of the weapons that won World War II for the Allies. I mean, it was a key weapon. The standard issue rifle through most of the war, the M1 Garand fires from an eight round clip. But unlike Japanese rifles, which are all slower bolt action weapons, the M1 is semi-automatic. It shoots every time Atkins pulls the trigger, allowing him to get off as many as eight shots in quick succession. But even with this weapon, Atkins is only one man, and 175 Japanese are waiting, feeding men into the line of fire all night. The pressure is intense. I think he was focused like a laser beam. Just put the horse blinders on, and he was focused entirely on trying to, to basically shoot at anything that was coming at him. Here's the shooting ground. Atkins' foxhole is one of a half dozen or so arranged roughly in a semicircular perimeter on the mountainside. A lieutenant, radio man, medic, and perhaps others are positioned in a center core, 20 to 50 yards to the rear of the perimeter. 175 Japanese soldiers are an unknown distance ahead of them. Only the darkness and rough terrain keep them from attacking as a large group. They'd have to come up almost nose to nose, I would guess, uh, eight to 10 yards. It was almost hand to hand, real close in fighting. The M1's rapid fire works for Atkins, who can barely see the enemy as they approach. Private Atkins was firing at shapes and sounds. But what would happen was you'd have to fire a number of shots just to make sure that you hit something you knew the enemy was closing in on you, and you didn't want him to get any closer. Atkins M1 jams unexpectedly. Frantically, he ducks into his slit trench and grabs the weapon dropped by one of his dead pals. The ammo, too. 
He needs every clip he can lay his hands on. In order to maintain his position, he just stayed there and fired like hell. The second rifle also jams, but there is one more in the trench. Atkins grabs it. He shoots at anything that moves. Laying low, avoiding enemy fire. Staying alive. Atkins will fire 400 rounds, reloading his rifle 50 times in his four hour shootout with the enemy. An incredible feat by almost any standard. He fired 400 rounds in approximately four hours. That's around every 36 seconds. Whereas a normal rifleman probably would fire seven to 10 rounds per week. You know, Tony Atkins was a farm boy from South Carolina, and he probably had a rifle on the farm. So uh, he could probably do things others couldn't do. So that's why uh, I'm not surprised. By 7 a.m., 13 Japanese dead are scattered in front of Atkins' position. His last rifle has jammed. He is nearly out of ammo. There's a lull in the fighting, so he heads to the rear for another weapon and more bullets. But the medic makes him stay. The wounds he so bravely ignored need treatment. Suddenly, he sees a single Japanese penetrating the perimeter. A rifle is within reach. Moments later, he's in the care of Igorots, indigenous mountain people who, like the natives all across the Pacific, help the allies by carrying supplies and the wounded. It's almost certain that Igorots would have had to carry him back. The reason being, there was no manpower. We were shorthanded. We had casualties. He was wounded. But even on the litter, he is alert. He suddenly looks up and sees a Japanese squad approaching the platoon's rear. Atkins still has a rifle. He sits up and fires off a clip. It's enough to drive the enemy off. The battle is over. And now, finally, Private Atkins can get the break he needs. Tommy Atkins' accomplishments were extraordinary truly heroic, truly unusual. Tommy Atkins is recognized for his bravery with the Medal of Honor. He survives the war, as does Olin Gray, who receives the Distinguished Service Cross for his solo shootout with Japanese machine gunners on New Georgia. Lieutenant Wilfred Lefrancois, leader of a Marine platoon on Macon, earns the Navy Cross for his bravery. He survives World War II, but is later killed in Korea. And Sergeant Clyde Thomason, the first to fall on Macon, is awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously. The nation's highest award is also worn by Everett Pope, who survives the horrific defense of Peleliu's Hill 100, as well as the war. I'm wearing this medal because I respect the men whom, whom I led. I'm not sure that I did anything personally to deserve it, but you've heard the expression, I was not a hero, but I was among heroes. And that's why I wear this medal. I wear it very proudly, very proudly. World War II ends in a spectacular fashion with a weapon of mass destruction. But reaching that point has been at the end of a gun as soldiers bear witness to their personal confrontations, looking the enemy in the eye and fighting for survival in the shootouts of the Pacific War.